Hi, I'm Robert Craddock. One of the reasons cricket has become such a celebrated game is the exceptional quality of some of the great writers and broadcasters who cover it. Australia has been lucky to produce a series of notable cricket journalists and one of the most respected of any era joins us tonight. He first started his cricket writing career as a fresh-faced youngster touring England with Ian Chappell's Australians in 1972. Over the next 40 years, he covered more than 200 test matches. He's interviewed Dennis Lilly sitting on the edge of his bath, Viv Richards sitting on his bed, and Sir Donald Bradman in his lounge room. His name is Michael Coward, and he is a cricket legend. Welcome, Mike. 53 years in journalism, and uh, to quote one of your famous quotes, still off the long run. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Crash. It's nice to be with you. I, I don't know whether I'm sort of generating too much pace <laughs> off that run now. Back to about two paces and flat offies. But no, we're still going all right. Thank you. But it's been a great career, and you've always been proud to be a, a sports journalist and a cricket writer, haven't you? And, and I've often felt it been a little bit devalued, haven't you, the yeah, profession? Yeah, I felt strongly about that over, over many, many years. Interesting, you should say, just the other day, had a call from a sports writer in uh, Los Angeles who's doing a thing on Australian sports writing, sports writing around the world, and was interested in the fact that I thought that way. But I, I have felt for a long time that it's bizarre that a country that that its international identity to such an extent has been built on sporting accomplishment and sporting achievement, that there's been a tendency, particularly in newspapers, to devalue the work of sports writers. And for a long, long time, some of the best writing in this country has always been in sport. I've, I've always found that mystifying and disappointing. And you sit here as such an august figure, you know, within Australian cricket writing, and yet it all started out from a very low base, wasn't it? So your, your humble beginnings. <laughs> it was very modest schooling, I can assure you of that. Um, and, uh, but I always had a love of sport as a kid. And um, my mother had an old royal typewriter on the back veranda of the home in Seacliff in Adelaide. And as a 12 and 13 year old, I'd be coming home from Australian football matches and uh, writing match reports. And even a couple of early cricket reports too, because I had a winter god and a summer god. My summer god was Les Favell, the great South Australian captain, Australian batsman, of course, who was Ian Chappell's great inspiration, and Bill Wedding, the Nord and South Australian ruckman. And uh, they were my winter gods and summer gods. And so I was working on the typewriter in a fairly modest way as a 12 and 13-year-old. And, Mike, congratulations on going three minutes into this interview without mentioning India, <laughs> because it was your great love affair, wasn't it? Yeah. You, you just love India. And, and I guess you opened the eyes of Australian cricket to India, didn't you? W where did the love affair sort of start? It's interesting you should say that. And I hope if, the, you, know, if you do have a legacy, um, and now in retirement, um, I do hope that that is, is marked down, because I'd, it was important to me to open the eyes uh, to the Australian cricket community, particularly in sporting community, to the value of India. I suppose, in a sense, I f could foresee what was going to happen. India now, of course, the most powerful nation in the cricket world. I was very irritated in the 80s, for Alan Border's sake and for, for, for others, that the achievements of the Australian team in, on the subcon were so devalued, so undervalued. I mean, 1986, the tied test, there's only been two in history, was the most astonishing game. Uh, virtually went unrecorded in Australia. Uh, the ABC didn't send. I did the ABC to into their newsroom after each day's play. They didn't send in 86. 87, World Cup, Australia win, and Border has his moment in the sun. After all those years of trying, ABC not there again. Channel 9 uh, televised the first innings, but not the second innings. Uh, Natasha Kinski and Dudley Moore in Unfaithfully Yours turned up in the second innings. <laughs> I mean, it was such an insult to Australian cricket and such an insult to border. And that's, uh, that's probably where my passion really intensified about uh, a love affair of India. And it prompted me to write Cricket Beyond the Bazaar, one of my early books. Are you serious? Dudley Moore? Dudley Moore and Natasha Kinski were in the Sunday night movie on Channel 9 instead of the second innings when Australia won the World Cup. That's extraordinary. And your writings on that are very emotional and they're very linked to border. You, that was the one thing you, you held through all those years. You so admired border. Very you? much and still do to this day. Um, I think it can mount a very strong argument that alongside Bradman and Benno that you can look to border as one of the great influences in Australian cricket. 
Now, I know all the, the Captain Grumpy, and if anybody had a, any entitlement to be grumpy, it was Border. I mean, no one man has had to do so much alone, as did Border. He had so little help on and off the ground. He was exceptional. But there were interesting moments. I loved it at the press conference when the other side of your relationship to Border, where you'd say, Alan, we're sick of these empty promises. And he'd look at you and go, well, Michael, it, it was on, wasn't it? It was, they were great moments, weren't they? Yeah, well, I, I understood what he was going through. And I think he respected too what I was doing in my job. And I think that's a fundamental difference that has changed as the game has evolved. I think the players of uh, the border era and on with War and Taylor, there was a greater understanding and a respect for the cricket media than there is today. There was a far better relationship then and an understanding of what our roles and responsibilities were. And Border, while he had no... I mean, he didn't want the captaincy initially. I mean, I can remember 1986 when he came very, very close to a nervous breakdown because of the pressure and he felt that he was being let down by everybody in that side. Um, but I, I think that was the thing. He respected what we had to do. Interesting times, weren't they? Like, nervous breakdown, they're strong words, but you were monitoring him very closely at that time. Very and and so. you felt he was right on the edge, did you? Is there any image or any point where you thought, this guy's in trouble? Yeah, very close in Dunedin. One day game, and um, he didn't front for the press conference. And um, I thought then, and in fact, Bob Merriman was the tour manager, and I talked to him quietly then, and it became very obvious that he was very close to breaking. It's interesting, we, we talk now, of course, and, and we've seen, sadly, in recent years, a number of players on the international scene break down because of, uh, of depression and the nervous strain. But let's not underestimate how much cricket was played after the World Series cricket revolution and moved in. The programming of the Australian team in the 80s uh, involving border was extraordinary, and there were just as many, if not more, pressures then because he, he was doing it alone. Speaking of the Tide Test, which was such a highlight uh, covering it in your career, I can only imagine the pressure of guys with typewriters <laughs> in that humidity, the paper getting wet. They say that some keystrokes went through the paper. Filing back then out of India, Michael, how you didn't have a nervous breakdown? We are perilously close to it. We were, <laughs> it, was, um, it was the night that the Brownlow medal um, in Melbourne was a tie as well. But it was an astonishing game. And um, I remember that. I mean, you, I mean, it's a privilege. I mean, there's only been two uh, Thai Test matches in history. And uh, I was there for that one. And it was, it was certainly hard, Yakka. And, yes, you're right about the keystrokes. In fact, I think some of us were working on thermal paper and with a sweat pouring from one's brow onto the thermal paper, the whole copy could disappear in, in, a, in a flash. And it was being done by telex operators underneath the stand. So you can imagine the pressure uh, with a tied test. All of us being resourceful journalists into the last half an hour, some had the winning stories and they had your losing stories, but nobody had the tied story. So it was frenetic. Greg Matthews claimed that Dean Jones's double century was overrated in that test. What did you think? It's outrageous. And so you expect nothing more from Matthews, I suppose. I mean, he continues to be outrageous in so many ways. It was an astonishing... I would rate it in the top four or five hands I've seen and certainly the most courageous hand I've ever seen. I mean, those conditions were oppressive in the extreme. The humidity, uh, the heat, the rank smells from the Buckingham Canal, uh, his cramping, he was vomiting on the, on the, on the pitch, um, and he played beautifully, absolutely beautifully, against a pretty handy attack led by uh, Kapil Dev. Let's go back to your first tour, Mike, 1972, the famous Ian Chappell tour uh, of England, which so many people saw as a turning point, and... Uh, you, as an Adelaide boy, struck up a nice rapport with Ian Chappell, didn't you? Great admirer of Chappell's, great admirer. I mean, he can be a contentious and a curmudgeonly figure in many ways, but the greatest qualities of Ian Chappell is honesty and his loyalty. And no man can ask more of a leader. There's been some wonderful illustrations of that on and off the ground, and known more so than the late Terry Jenner when he was... Uh, uh, detained at Her Majesty's pleasure for a while because of uh, a misdemeanour. And who was the one who was writing to him while he was uh, in jail? It was Ian Chappell. Jenna came out of jail and returned to Adelaide Oval for a test match. He said to Chappell, oh, I'll meet you around the back. I'll walk around the back of the stand. And Chappell said, no, you won't. You'll walk in front of the stand and I'll walk with you. Always the captain, always the leader. 
you listed some of your career highlights as interviewing Viv Richards while sitting on his bed, interviewing <laughs> Dennis Lilly while sitting on his bath. Yeah. I mean, th this is access that's long gone, Mike, isn't it? Yeah, it was a very different world then. I mean, it was a lot more relaxed. I mean, the 72 team to England, for instance, where I did interview Lily on the bath, um, he said, oh, come in prop there and, and we'll give you the yarn. You know, I've never had any troubles with uh, with Lily. A lot of members of the Fourth Estate have, mind you, but I've always found him honest and uh, and and fair. But yeah, the access was was different. Yeah, I, could, I propped on a cot next to uh, to Vivi Richards at the hotel in uh, in Darlinghurst here in Sydney, and that sort of access, of course, it's a great pity. I mean, I know the game has changed. You know, the whole world of sport has changed, and there's there's manager. None of the, there was no such thing as managers. There was no such thing as media managers. Uh, you might have had uh, executives of a, of a cricket association who were keen to talk to you and to give you a, a, a head a head start, but we had to be so much more resourceful. So much more resourceful. There are some old photos of you uh, and the 1972 boys touring England with uh, you with a cigarette in your hand at the end of the group. And, <laughs> and Richie Benno, of course, was part of that press corps as a pressman. Yeah. What was it like being the absolute junior in the group and having Richie as sort of the doyen? Well, there was uh, some pressure there. The, the test match in, at Lords was extraordinary. Uh, Bob Massey took 16 for 137. He was ducking the ball all over the place. And um, yeah, as you can imagine, with the wickets falling at that rate, it was frantic. And suddenly, uh, you know, I'm working away, and suddenly there alongside me is Richie Benno, who really wouldn't have known who I was. And he said, are you managing all right? Anything I can do to help? Now, you never forget that. You never forget that sort of, here's Richie Benno, legendary player, leader, commentator, journalist, uh, standing alongside someone he barely knew, saying, are you managing OK? Is there anything I can do to help? You never forget that sort of uh, assistance and thoughtfulness, you know, and I always greatly respected Richie for that. What about your dealings with Bradman, Mike? They were complex. Any favourite stories? He, I've, I've got to say that he was, he was generous to me. But the, the one thing with Bradman, and I think that everything was always done at Bradman's terms. Always. And that's where a lot of the pressures came and a lot of the misunderstandings came. I got the only interview with him when I was working for The Age um, in Melbourne uh, for the 50 years of Bodyline in 82-3. And um, I f flew to Adelaide for the interview and went out to his place in, in Holden Street. And he was very welcoming. Of course, it had been teed up by the executives of the age that this would be done. And, of course, it would be done at his terms. He would see the final copy. He would see the final proofs, et cetera, et cetera. And he was a pedant um, to the extreme. Like, I made reference to a bar that he had received as, um, as a trophy sometime in the 1930s. Well, that was very promptly uh, changed to drinks cabinet. Um, and things like that. I mean, that was Bradman to a T. Uh, he had control of the conversation. He had control uh, of everything. And even when he had finished um, as a uh, administrator with the SACA and with Cricket Australia, he was still the most powerful figure. Very few would make a decision without first uh, workshopping it with Sir Donald. He was amazingly powerful. The day I went for the interview, he was so excited, he just got one of the roller door things that he could work <laughs> like this. And so, and he drove me back to the hotel where I was staying, but he was just so excited to show off his roller door. Small things, Michael. <laughs> small things, small. When you've averaged 99.94, <laughs> small things are fair enough. Um, and uh, so on that basis, yes, he was generous and I respected that. But everything was always done at his terms. Kerry Packer was another interesting one because you covered the Packer revolution. Some people say that World Series cricket was Packer for Packer and it's all just been a little bit sugar-coated, as in I, but it was basically him feathering his own nest. Do you go down that line or do you no. think, no, he helped the game? Yeah, I do. Oh, I think he uh, immeasurably helped the game. I mean, it was a cl classic case of the Masters and the Serfs. I mean, the administration didn't care about the welfare of the players. I mean, Sheffield Shield cricket, what was it, 30, 30 bucks a day and a laundry allowance. Mm. I mean, they didn't care. They had to take time off from work to play Shield cricket, you know, to qualify to play. They, there was no regard for the welfare of the players. I mean, it's usually thought that Ian Chappell drove it. 
but it was DK Lilly who really drove it. And uh, Lilly went to Chapel and to, to Rod Marsh, uh, and, and they were the power base, but Lilly really drove it. His sense of injustice, in fact, in many ways, he still feels deeply affronted over many things, Lilly. That, uh, th that they were treated in such a cavalier way by the establishment. And, and while there's obviously been a lot of changes in attitude um, at establishment level, Lilly still feels it very deeply. He was gravely affronted by that, and that's why he drove it. But, no, I believe Mr Packer cared about the game, and he certainly cared about the welfare of the players. Whether the method of operation met with everybody's appro uh, approval is another matter altogether. I'm sure that brings back memories. The one and only Here Come the Aussies, recorded after a late-night drinking session on the 1970 tour by the Australian team, and you were there amongst I, them. I was there. And what about the flip side? Ball a ball, swing a bat. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> no, that's, no, that's I don't want to. <laughs> that's a shocker too. It was a very funny night. It was at the London Sports Club, I think, as I recall. In those days, there were many receptions for touring Australian teams. And, of course, the players enjoyed them. They didn't run away from them. Nowadays, you can't get a, a player to any official function on a tour, you know, which is another sadness because that, in a sense, dismisses the history of the game and what's gone before. But, yeah, it was a very funny night. I think it was recorded probably the final take and there was only a couple of them, of course. <laughs> it probably won 1.30 in the morning. What about the other side of the coin? Were there any players who really disliked you, who you fell out with and, you know, never sort of repaired the relationship? Yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. Um, I've struggled with two or three particularly um, who didn't, uh, didn't like a particular line I took. Yeah. Any names? Well, Terry Alderman was one. You know, was a very distinguished swing bowler, you know, a uh, fine bowler, particularly in England in 81 and 89. And I, in my um, farewell piece to him, just made the point how good he could have been in England in 85 when Border had no one. But he was off getting his Kruger rands in South Africa. And he took exception to that and has never spoken to me since. Uh, I mean, I thought it was a disgrace what he did. Um, but that was his decision. But uh, as a responsible cricket writer and journalist, you couldn't ignore the fact that the world's premier bowler in those conditions absented himself from England in 1985 for other reasons. Mike, one of the most distressing moments uh, of your time in cricket was the death of Peter Roebuck who uh, committed suicide. At the time, there were looming sexual harassment allegations. What, what do you make of, of the Roebuck scenario? Yeah, it's an incredibly complex story. I mean, he was a complex individual. I, I don't think we'll ever know, Crash. I really don't. I had a good rapport with him. You know, you had a good rapport with him. I mean, we always felt that we had a reasonable rapport with him, but we never knew him. No. Um, and that's the sadness. I don't know the complexity of his personal life. Who would know? Mm. Uh, he never confided in me um, about his, uh, his personal life. He was a, very much a loner. But he, he was driven by social justice issues. Um, he cared deeply about the, uh, uh, the young men, not boys, as yeah. so many of his distractors will say. Mm -hmm. Weren't boys, they were young men, you know, yeah. 18 to 25 yeah. to yeah. 30, um, you know, who could be responsible for their own actions and attitudes. Um, but he cared desperately mm. for their welfare um, from the orphanage in, uh, in Harare in Zimbabwe, and that's where it began. And he self-educated many, many, many uh, of those young men. And, of course, that led to the establishment of the LBW Trust, and mm. I still sit on the board of the LBW Trust, Learning for a Better World Trust, which was inspired by Roebuck's commitment and is now one of cricket's great charities. Was part of this issue, Peter, being confused over his sexuality? I would have thought so. But... And by that I'm saying that he refused to concede that he was gay. I mean, I, I heard that you had chats to him about that and, and encouraged him to, but, I mean, it, it was never actually proven. Was it? And we all we all left that on tour, didn't we? We never spoke about it. We all just let Roby being Roby, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, well, I mean, as a gay man, I thought that if, 
you know, he could talk to me, surely. And I know how difficult it is to come to terms with who you are, yeah. um, only too well. You know, I had a very painful period growing up. Um, and so I understood that. I mean, mm. that's the sadness. None of us know. And it was a waste, a, mm. a waste. A mm. wonderful writer. I thought a better writer than commentator, but a very good commentator as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I worked with him on the ABC and in India and South Africa. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's just a, 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 a dreadful loss. Mike, you talked about your own challenges. Was it difficult for, for you as a young guy? You spoke about things that you had to come to grips with. Yeah, I th you have your challenges. Um, I, I, was, I was adopted, um, and, uh, but I was adopted into a very loving household. Um, and certainly I struggled with my sexuality for a long, long time, well into my 20s, really. And, um, but uh, you get through those periods, and I've always had tremendous support from within the community too, and the cricket community. I've never had... I mean, what might happen behind your back, I've got no idea. But, at, 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 you know, at, at eye-to-eye -eye level, um, always tremendously supportive. Many of the players would always ask after Peter Bully, my partner. Mm. Uh, we've been together for uh, over 35 years. Craig McDermott, Alan Border, Dean Jones, you know, who, when Peter's toured with me at the end of the tour, would always after after his welfare. So they've always been open and accepting. So, and for that, I've been extremely grateful, like... Um, the members of our cricket writing community. And, of course, you had a special major with Ian Chappell, didn't you? Like, we'd often hear stories you'd go to Gene Pitney concerts <laughs> and... Uh... He's a Pitney fan, <laughs> as was I, of course. You know, <laughs> Dearest, darling, I had to write and say that I wouldn't be home anymore. But, yeah, we took off there. And so was John McLean, your man in Queensland. A huge Pitney man. You used to do a mock intro, didn't you, for Gene Pitney coming on stage? I thought you could, yes. Yeah. You could. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the glittering chandelier room. Now, make welcome the sensational, the sexual, the scintillating Mr Emotion, Mr Gene Pitney. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> Mr Emotion. <laughs> yeah, Mr Emotion. And, and, of course, no Australian cricket writer's function was ever quite complete before you sung If I Were a Rich Man, <laughs> wasn't it? Where did that come from? Uh, well, I, I've always loved show music, always loved show music. And, um, of course, Fiddler on the Roof is terrific. And, uh, yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. And, I mean, there was a period years ago when uh, the... It might have... Oh, you might have just got into the, uh, the system where, <laughs> where we had Christmas carols in the, the Sheridan, not in the presidential room. Uh, the, there used to be a Sydney test, build, uh, a Perth test building up to Christmas and uh, we'd have a carol night. And all the journos, I can remember um, um, Tony Crafter, Mel Johnson, uh, other umpires joining the, the community and passers-by, uh, have a carol night and uh, a few drinks to go with it, of course. And, and Jimmy Wood would do, would do um, a Good King Wenceslas on his head. You know, anything could happen. <laughs> Mike, of course, you were always more than just a cricket writer. And in 1972, you were there the day when the sporting world lost its innocence at the Munich Olympics as a young sports reporter seeing the, the terrorism that, that rocked the games in the world. It must have been an extraordinary experience. Yeah, it was. It's interesting, Crash, because when it actually happened, we were no closer to it. And we were watching it in the village from the press room um, on television like everybody else. But where it really struck home to me was at the closing ceremony. Then you had a sense of, my God, you know, the violation of something that we think is so beautiful and so honest and just a wonderful expression of of manhood, of womanhood, the Olympic Games, an expression of athleticism, and suddenly it's been violated in a way that you, you couldn't believe could happen. And, of course, sadly, you know, we've seen a hell of a lot since then, which is just so, so desperately sad. And I think that's when it really impacted the minute silence at the closing ceremony. I think everybody understood then that the, the Olympics could never quite be the same again. Was it true that you once gave Rod Laver a lift in your, in your beaten-up old convertible, was it? Or? It was a beaten-up Morris Oxford, which I think I bought for a mate for about 85 quid. I mean, he'd just beaten Ilya Nastasi on boards at Albert Hall and it was just belting down um, after and I was g going and I said to him, he was staying at the Kensington Palace Hotel, not all that far from there, 
And I said, do you want to ride? He had his... Uh, you know how they present him with cheques? This massive cheque for, I don't know what it was, £50,000 or whatever it is. So he had that, and so we put that in the back of the, the Morris Minor, drove up to... Uh, and, the, and the very pompous, pretentious um, doorman at the Kensington Palace opened the door for him and said, I see you've come in style tonight, Mr Labor. And Labor, to his undying credit, just looked up and said, I came with a mate. Mr Labor at his best. Did you have any great affection for, for anyone in the modern era that really stood out? I must say I loved watching Sachin Tendorka. It's interesting, isn't it, that they say that he was the closest to Bradman. Bradman's, of course, famous line to Lady Jessie that, you know, come down, you know, have a look at this boy, doesn't he remind you of me, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, which he took enormous pride. And I had a, a lot of pleasure when uh, he was brought to... Tendorka came out for Bradman's 90th birthday and I hosted the big function um, in Adelaide when Shane Warne and uh, such and went out to Sir Donald's place. And, um, and he loved that night. He loved that night, um, such and... And uh, I would love to have been a fly on the wall. Can you imagine them, what they were talking about? You know, field placements and tactics and particularly against short pitch bowling and stuff like that. I love watching him play. And the way he took to Shane Warne. If Warne was the greatest leg spinner of all time, and it's, you know, you can mount a very strong argument for that, the way that Tendulkar just dismissed him um, on, in Indian conditions was just remarkable. So that was a, a great batsman against a great bowler. And, yeah, I very much watched and, uh, and enjoyed talking to Sachin too. And he's been very good in interv interviews as well. Mike, you're, you're a great protector of, of Test cricket and a great advocate of it. Do you fear for its future? Very much, very much fear for it. And I think the players, frankly, have got to do more. Uh, they talk about the pride, they talk about the baggy green, they talk about the significance of it. Um, quietly, often, amongst themselves, they've got to be more public about it. They've got to talk about it. Um, we're losing the history. We're losing the history. You can talk so much about the greatness of Test match cricket and you, there are reference points in Test match cricket. There are no reference points in T20. There's no reference points in one-day game except for the World Cup. World Cups are important. They have a history. They're a reference point. Test cricket has the reference points. But unless we talk about them and talk about the joy of Test cricket, um, we'll lose it. You know, the short forms are easily forgotten, Crash. Test match cricket generally is unforgettable. Well said, Mike. It's been wonderful chatting today. I feel as I sit here, I'm representing generations of journalists who owe you so much for being a friend and a mentor to us all. You've looked after all our interests and encouraged us through our journeys and just want to say you're a cricket legend. Well played, Michael. Thank you very much, Crash. It's been 50, great being with you. 53 years and still coming out strong. <laughs>